Good morning. Nice to have you with us. The Michigan legislature only has about six weeks left before the start of a new fiscal year. It has a lot of work to do to develop a new state budget that will be accepted by the governor. How is that process going? That's one of the questions we'll ask our guest this morning. Governor Gretchen Whitmer is here, and our conversation starts right now. From TV6, this is The Ryan Report. Here's your host, Don Ryan. My guest this morning is Gretchen Whitmer, who took over as governor of Michigan on January 1st of this year. Whitmer's inauguration marked the first time in eight years the state had a Democrat governor and Republican legislature. Both sides have talked bipartisanship, but there are some big issues to be resolved today. We'll get the governor's thoughts on those challenges ahead. Governor, welcome back. To the Thank Ryan you. Report. Thank you. I'm glad to be with you. Nice to see you. I know you're on a very fast track, so I appreciate your taking time to be here. Absolutely. I know you've got a wonderful program, and we weren't able to spend as much time together last time, so tried to extend it a little bit this time. Get a time. few more minutes. <laughs> well, the, there are a lot of key issues, but first of all, how's it going? How are you enjoying the job after about seven or eight months? Yeah, you know, it is a challenging job. It is one that I'm very grateful to have the, the chance to be the 49th governor of this great state. This is a miraculous place, and the best part of our state are the people who call it home, and I'm inspired every day to continue the work that, that I've set out to do, to um, build bridges literally and figuratively, politically, geographically. I think that our greatest strength is, is in our people, and b rebuilding the foundation of the state is where we ensure everyone really has an opportunity to get ahead. I don't know if citizens realize how much work comes up in that first few months or so. So many appointments to make, department heads to put in place, That's right. keyboards and commissions. How is that process going? So it's been, I have a wonderful team in the executive office. And during the short period of time between the election and when I was sworn in as governor, we did an incredible amount of work vetting and um, picking people to be a lead individual departments. We've reorganized some departments. The What was used to be known as DEQ was right. now EGLE. Right. What was known as TED is now LEO, Labor and um, you know Economic Opportunity. And so we've put our stamp on state government and put real experts in positions of power. So around that table, we've got real representation, whether it is uh, geographic representation, socioeconomic, religious, racial. Uh, and I think that because of that, we're really um, hitting our stride and, and doing a lot of good things already. Let's talk about issues, and there are a lot on the table, but one of the big ones has been resolved, and that was car insurance. That's right. Are, are you happy with the results? I am. You know, um, this was an issue that leaders previous could never figure out how to tackle. It, they worked on it for five years. We got it done in the first five months, and it was bipartisan, which is really important. You know, we have a, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, I'm a Democratic governor and I'm working with a Republican legislature and I've said from day one, we're Michiganders first. And the people of Michigan care less about our politics and our political parties than they do about results that make their lives better. And so focusing on bringing down the cost of auto insurance, uh, finding some common ground, giving, uh, per giving consumers a choice and having mandated rollbacks were a couple of pieces that were really important. And so we've gotten it done. It won't be fully in effect until next year. It takes a while to right. change a system that's been there for decades, but I do think that this is gonna give people relief and I'm glad to say that it was real bipartisanship at its best. Yeah, that is interesting because it, it didn't happen with a Republican governor and Republican legislature, but it did happen with a Democrat in the governor's office. What was the difference? You brought some Democrats along with you for one thing, I guess. I did, and you know, I was in a position to make sure that it really was um, savings for people and that we maintained our, our safety net. So if someone is catastrophically injured, they have the protections that they need. And that was um, a negotiation process. It was not fun at times. There were moments where it all looked like it was gonna blow up and, and fail, and yet we all stayed at the table and continued to work. And it was, I think, in part because from day one, I've made a real effort to ensure that we have an open line of communication. It doesn't mean we're gonna agree on everything, but I know we'll never find common ground if we're not at least talking and getting to know each other. And that's what I've really worked hard to do with the Republican leadership in both the House and Senate, as well as the Democratic leaders. Are you finding your experience in the legislature is helping in this process? Well, I have taken tough votes, and I know how hard the job can be, and I know that we have mutual constituents, and that 
it is critical that we never lose sight of the people at home that we serve every single day. It's unique because I serve you know, all 83 counties now. Yeah. Uh, but I have been in that seat and I have a great deal of respect for people who put their names on the ballot and serve their communities. And regardless of whether or not we're in the same political party, we have a job to do and the people of Michigan expect us to get it done. One of the really big issues out there is still fixing the roads, which was a major campaign issue for Fixing you. the what roads? I know that. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, you, um, you came forward with a proposal to raise the gas tax by 45 cents. It was mm -hmm. not well received by anybody, really. And, and so where do we go from here? So I ran for on fixing problems right. and being honest with the public about what it's going to take. We've been told we can have everything and pay for nothing, and we've been sold a bill of goods. Michiganders know that for 40 years we've been disinvesting in our infrastructure, and we're all paying for it. We're paying in the form of higher car insurance premiums. We're paying in the form of having to fix our cars when our roads are being um, continuing to decline. And right now in Michigan, we're closing a bridge every other week. We're closing Amazing. bridges because yeah. they are they are dangerous. And so this is a crisis that we have to take on. I did not create the $2.5 billion road problem that we have in the state, but I am determined to fix it. And I respect the public enough to give them an honest solution. It was not easy for me to come forward with a 45 cent gas tax. I didn't want to lead with that. I don't want to pay a 45 right. cent gas tax. But I also don't want a bridge to crumble and endanger people and scare the heck out of businesses who are thinking about coming to Michigan or undermine mobility, which is something that we still have the edge in. And so I put an honest solution on the table. Now the legislature understands how bad the problem is, but cannot come up with an alternative. And that's why we still don't have a budget done because they've decided to take a summer recess instead of staying in Lansing and, and negotiating a budget. Not having a budget is hurting our school districts, all of whom started their fiscal year on July 1st. We're six weeks into their school year and they don't even know what they're really working with and yet they're supposed to be making all their plans and you know spending right. money uh, you know, over a 12th of the way into their, their fiscal year. So fixing the roads is, a, is, is paramount. When we do it the right way, dollars that were stolen from our kids' education can get back into the schools across the state and make a real investment in our kids gives us the ability to clean up drinking water. And we know that from the western end of the UP to downtown Detroit, whether it's PFAS or it's old infrastructure or it's things leaching into our water, we have to be serious about that. And so all of this is related. And so I understand that people have heartburn about a 45 cent gas tax. I do too. But the longer we go without actually addressing this, the more expensive it gets and the more dangerous it gets. And as a mom, as the leader of this state, I want to. I want us to try to fix this problem once and for all. Okay, we'll talk more about that in just a couple of minutes. We have to take a quick break. We'll be back in just two minutes. Again, we're talking today with Governor Gretchen Whitmer. Um, you were quoted uh, earlier this week in in the media as saying you'd be willing to consider some stopgap measure, and that you and the legislature are very committed to to not shutting down state government. So, what's likely to happen? Well, what I know is that we've seen state government shut down. We've seen our federal government shut down in just last year. And we know that every one of us pays a huge price for that happening. Um, Republican or Democratic alike, businesses, individuals, we're all hurting when government doesn't actually deliver. And so as a possibility, I said, you know, we could actually, we could have a conversation about a continuation budget at the appropriate time. I think we're going to get a budget done. I think we're going to get it on time. And I don't think that this is a conversation we're going to look back on and say, oh, why, why do we even spend a minute talking about it? But the fact of the matter is, um, I think that the prospect of, of us not getting a budget done in time, it would be devastating for a lot of reasons for a lot of people in the state. And I'm determined to make sure that doesn't happen. We have probably about six weeks left before yep. the deadline. September 30th, and you can't wait till September 30th to get bills to the governor's desk. It ha they really have to get there about two weeks beforehand, so it's about a month. No pun intended, but are, what are the other roadblocks to, uh, <laughs> to uh, getting that <laughs> Once you that start, you can't stop. <laughs> I'm gonna give you concrete <laughs> solutions, right? Okay, like, right. you can't stop with road analogies. Right. Um, well, you know, I think that I, I put a real solution on the table that puts us in a position to 
close the skills gap and do a better job educating our children, giving teachers the support that they need um, to, you know, clean up our drinking water. These are the, the things that people and businesses alike really need us to find our way to solve. I put that solution on the table and because I think that the legislature is really struggling to come up with an alternative that is doable, um, I think that's, that's the real problem here. That's why they've taken their summer break without getting a budget done. This is the first time in nine years that the legislature has taken a summer vacation before a budget is finished. Rating agencies are paying attention. School districts are worried. And I think um, it is really important that they get back down to Lansing and stay there until this budget is completed. Do you think you're fairly close on things like K-12 education financing? No. No. <laughs> Unfortunately, you, you I wish I could say yes. Okay. Um, you know, I think that when once we figure out how we are going to pay for infrastructure, that it puts us in a position to make all the other decisions on the budget. I'm not going to go along with anything, though, that takes money away from education in order to, to fix our roads. We need to do both, and we can't do one at the expense of the other. It is a, it's a false choice, and it's time for us to find our common ground on both, both measurements. In, in your state of the state message, you proposed free uh, community college for students in Michigan and, and some support at the university level as well. Mm -hmm. Is that proposal still on the table and still have an opportunity? So we introduced um, legislation around the Michigan Reconnect and the My Opportunity Initiative. The Michigan Reconnect and My Opportunity both have bipartisan support and bipartisan sponsorship. Of course, they both need to be funded. We can create all the programs in the world, but if you don't put the resources behind them, they're, they're not particularly uh, impactful. And so the My Opportunity is the one that is uh, in a you know, debt-free community college opportunity for every Michigan graduate. Right. That's the one that I, I think really could change our whole um, outlook in Michigan in terms of closing that skills gap. It's one that will be a part of the budget discussion. Many people believe, many people in the know, many people in business believe that the biggest impediment to economic development and job growth is the lack of qualified employees. Mm -hmm. are, are we on track to deal with those? Uh, the MEDC will tell you that between now and 2026, there will be 525,000 jobs that are unfilled, good-paying jobs because of the skills gap, and that's why the work that we're doing is so critical. We've got to close that skills gap. There are good-paying jobs that are going unfilled today in Michigan because our people don't have the opportunity to get the skills they need, and that's why whether it's the Michigan Reconnect or the My Opportunity Scholarship or some of the amazing work that we're doing with Going Pro um, and working with CTE programs and, right. and Michigan Works, there's a wonderful number of tools that we have, but we've, my goal is to make sure that we're harnessing it and then you know, um, really putting more energy into it because it's a shame if people are struggling and there are great jobs that are going unfilled just because there's a skills gap. I have a few more questions. We'll get to those in just a minute. Back with more on the Ryan Report after we take this break. Again, we're talking today with Governor Gretchen Whitmer. A few other questions. Enbridge Line 5, mm -hmm. uh, obviously a, different, a difficult subject. Many people would like to see it shut down. Others feel the tunnel is a good solution. Where do we stand today? So let, I want to start with a couple of things. Okay. First, the most important thing um, is protecting our Great Lakes. There is uh, one thing that defines us, you know, unlike any other place on the planet, and that is that we are stewards of 21% of the world's fresh water. It's in the Great Lakes. 84% of our nation's fresh, fresh water is the Great Lakes. So protecting it from an oil spill is really important. Ensuring that people in the Upper Peninsula and the Northern Lower Peninsula have access to affordable energy is as important. And so that's why, as governor, I've been trying to bring everyone to the table and come up with a solution that does both of those things. The previous governor and previous legislature tried to tie my hands with regard to a tunnel. I asked the attorney general for an opinion whether or not what they did was legal, and she said no. Right now, um, unfortunately, Enbridge wasn't able to agree to terms that, that I thought would be acceptable to the Attorney General as well. And so they've gone to court to sue me to enforce the Snyder Agreement. When we have a determination on that, we'll know then what our next steps are. But I do think that um, the, 
will anticipate a court decision probably in the next few months. There's no question as to fact. It's a question of law. And if that agreement is not enforceable, then Enbridge is going to have to get back to the table and negotiate with me. And I'm going to demand um, you know, that we have real action quickly to get it out of the water, but also I would be open to negotiating other terms. Do you think the tunnel is a reasonable solution if done on the timeline that you find acceptable? I think that it, it could be. Okay. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. Yeah, we will. I mean, I, 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 I don't like resolving things in court if there's an opportunity yeah. to negotiate, but it was very clear that Enbridge was not going to do that, and the Attorney General was eager to take them to court on the other easements. So. Uh, there's a lot to be determined yet, and I just know this. My goal is to protect the Great Lakes and to ensure that people in the Upper Peninsula and Lower Peninsula have access to affordable energy. And that's why I recently created the Energy Task Force, so that we really can assess how do we build out um, a system to ensure people have, have access. Because one way or another, that tunnel is, is living on borrowed time, and it's, it's a matter of time when we're going to have to have an, an alternative plan, and I want to know what our options are going to look like. We have a big presidential race coming up. What advice do you have for the candidates? Get to Michigan and listen to Michiganders. The best thing I did was get into all 83 counties of this state. It's a huge state, and I'm not saying presidential candidates have the time to do all of that, right. but they really should spend a lot of time in this state. We're a state full of hardworking, good people who love their families and expect their government to work for them and stay focused on the things that matter. That's what I learned as I got across the state. I planted the flag in Alger County. It was the 83rd county that I got to in my statewide tour. And not that, not that it was the least important, but I wanted to save uh, pictured rocks uh, in the background for the, the very 83rd county. The UP is very important. The Lower Peninsula, we have a real voice in this next election. The whole world's gonna be looking at Michigan because all path to the White House go through our state. Besides, Alger County is named after a former governor, so that's important too. <laughs> the, um, I know you're concerned about the Great Lakes and you're trying to spread that story among, among the, the candidates and yep. others. You know, the, the Great Lakes is 84% of the nation's fresh water. And whenever I use that statistic and I'm talking to my fellow governors from outside of the Midwest, they're stunned. No one really appreciates what a big deal that is. And that's why I harnessed uh, this great bipartisan group of governors to come together around a, an agenda that prioritizes the Great Lakes. Everyone thinks about the Pacific. Everyone thinks about you know the two coasts, right? But the most important coast is the freshwater coast, and that is ours. That is, we are stewards of it, and we need Washington to prioritize, support the Great Lakes, and to get serious about protecting them. We have only a short time left, but you made an important announcement about uh, Pine Mountain Ski Hill. Tell us about that. Yes, yeah, so we are going to make a $3 million investment, and ski jumping is something that happens 12 months out of the year. I'm even learning things about right. ski jumping and ski flying. Um, and I think that we have a real opportunity to make Michigan a place where we host international competitions. And we wanted to work closely with the um, Federation of International Skiing as well right. as uh, Pine Mountain and, and make sure that we're building out all of the infrastructure to support Michigan being a destination uh, for international competition. So we can probably look forward to seeing you when that, when that uh, International Cup race is held at Pine Mountain. Attending but not participating. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good plan. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming in. I enjoyed it very much. Hope uh, you did. Me too. Always do. Okay. We'll be back with some other thoughts for you after we take this break. Well, our guest this morning, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, is appropriately known as Michigan's 49th governor, even though she is only the 48th person to serve as governor of our state. As some of you may remember, this is all possible because of Frank Fitzgerald, the only person to be elected to two separate terms. He was elected the state's 34th governor in 1935, defeated in his bid for re-election by Frank Murphy, who became the 35th governor, and two years later, Fitzgerald was again elected so he was actually the state's 34th and 36th governor. He's also the only Michigan governor to die in office. He passed away shortly after beginning his second term. Some of those facts I shared with you once before, but here are some other Michigan governor trivia. Michigan's first governor was a Democrat, Stevens T. Mason. He served from 1835 to 1840. Mason was a pretty interesting story. In 1831, at 19 years of age, 
he was named Secretary of the Michigan Territory. That was two years before he could even vote. After leading the territory's successful push for statehood, he would defend his state's borders and orchestrate the expansion through the annexation of the Upper Peninsula, all before his official election as Michigan's first governor at age 24, the youngest chief executive in any state's history. And you know, we don't hear much about the Whig Party today, but there are two former governors who represented that party. The state's second governor, William Woodbridge, was elected in 1840 and left the governor's office to become a U.S. Senator. He was replaced by James Wright Gordon, who took office as the third governor and the second and final member of the Whig Party to lead the state. What other Michigan governor trivia can I offer? Well, there are two counties in Upper Michigan that are named for former governors. Russell Alger started his term in 1885 and Cyrus Luce in 1887. And here's an interesting coincidence. In its over 180-year history, the state has had only two women governors, both Democrats, Gretchen Whitmer, who occupies that seat today, and Jennifer Granholm, who served from 2003 through 2010. Both were Democrats. And through its history, Michigan has had 19 Democrats serve as governor, while 27 Republicans have filled that position. There were also the two from the Whig Party I mentioned earlier. And the governor with the longest first name was Epaphroditus Ransom, who was elected to one term in 1848. Not sure how he got his name, but Epaphroditus does appear twice in the Bible in Philippians. And now do you know more about than you probably wanted to know about Michigan governors? I'll be back in a minute. Our guest this morning, Governor Gretchen Whitmer, is appropriately known as Michigan's 49th governor, even though she's only the 48th person to serve as governor of our state. Some of you may remember this is all possible because of Frank Fitzgerald, the only person elected to two separate terms. He was elected the state's 34th governor in 1935, but was defeated in his bid for re-election by Frank Murphy, who became the 35th governor. Two years later, Fitzgerald was again elected so he was actually the state's 34th and 36th governor. Fitzgerald is also the only Michigan governor to die in office. He passed away shortly after beginning his second term. Some of those facts I shared with you once before, but here are some other Michigan governor trivia. Michigan's first governor was a Democrat, Stevens T. Mason, served from 1835 to 1840. Has a pretty interesting history. In 1831, at 19 years of age, he was named Secretary of the Michigan Territory. That was two years before he could even vote. After leading the territory's successful push for statehood, he would defend his state border and orchestrate its expansion through the annexation of the Upper Peninsula, all before his official election as Michigan's first governor at age 24, making him the youngest chief executive in any state's history. And we don't hear much about the Whig Party today, but there are two former governors who represented that party. The state's second governor, William Woodbridge, was elected in 1840 and left the governor's office to become a U.S. Senator. He was replaced by James Wright Gordon, who took office as the third governor and the second and final member of the Whig Party to lead the state. What other Michigan governor trivia can I offer? Well, there are two counties in Upper Michigan that are named for former governors. Russell Alger started his term in 1885 and Cyrus Luce in 1887. And here's an interesting coincidence. They served back-to-back -back terms, and Alger and Luce are side-by-side -side counties. In its over 180-year history, the state has had only two women governors, Gretchen Whitmer, who occupies that seat today, and Jennifer Granholm, who served from 2003 through 2010. Both were Democrats. Through its history, 
Michigan has had 19 Democrats serve as governor, while 27 Republicans have filled that position. And there were also the two from the Whig Party I mentioned earlier. The governor with the longest first name was Epaphroditus Ransom, who was elected to one term in 1848. Not sure how he got his name, but Epaphroditus does appear twice in the Bible in Philippians. So now you probably know more than you wanted to know about Michigan governors. I'll be back in a minute. Well, that's our show for another week. The Today Show will be here in just a moment. Remember, this show is also available on the Internet at UpperMichiganSource.com. Past episodes are available now. Today's show will be available starting tomorrow afternoon. Thanks to Governor Gretchen Whitmer for coming in today to give us an update on important issues in Lansing. And thank you for joining us. Let's get together again next Sunday morning.